Okay, so I've been adorning Adam Curtis's documentary films with a lot of praise lately, and so I figured when we're discussing this particular three-part series, The Power of Nightmares, I'll read out uh, some segments of Wikipedia's article for this film, particularly where the political reaction of, of the film was concerned, because it, it details some of the criticism, some of the counterpoints people have to Curtis's work, this one in particular. But first, I'll just read out this content app, just so those of you who have not seen The Power of Nightmares get an idea of what we're, where we're coming from with this. Adam Curtis originally intended to make a film about conflict within the conservative movement between the ideologies of neoconservative elitism and the more individualist libertarian factions. During his research into the conservative movement, Curtis discovered what he saw as similarities in the origins of the neoconservative and Islamist ideologies. The topic of the planned documentary shifted to these other two ideologies, with the libertarian element eventually being phased out. Curtis first pitched the idea of a documentary on conservative ideology in 2003 and spent half a year researching the film. Final recordings were made on the 10th of October, 19th of October, and the 1st of November, 2004. As with many of Curtis's films, The Power of Nightmares uses a montage of stock footage taken from the BBC archives, which Curtis narrates. Curtis has credited James Mossman as the inspiration for his montage technique, which he first employed for the 1992 series Pandora's Box. While his use of humour has been credited to the, his first work of television as a talent scout for the magazine program That's Life, Curtis has also compared the entertainment aspect of his films to the Fox News Channel in America, claim that the network is successful because of their viewers really enjoying what they're doing. To help drive his points, Curtis uses interviews of various political and intellectual figures. In the first two parts, former Arms Control and Disarmament Agency member Anne Kahn and former American Spectator writer David Brock accused the neoconservatives of knowingly using false evidence of wrongdoing in their campaigns against the Soviet Union and President Bill Clinton. Jason Burke, author of Al-Qaeda, Casting a Shadow of Terror, comments in the shadows in the cave on the failure to expose the massive terrorist network in Afghanistan. Additional interviews of major figures are added to drive the film's narrative. Neoconservatives William and Irving Crystal, Richard Pipes, Richard Pearl, and Michael Ledeen are invited to provide a neoconservative view of the film's subject. The history of Islamism is discussed by the Institute of Islamic Political Thoughts, Azam Tamimi, political scientist Roxanne Eubin, and Islamist Abdullah Anas. The film's soundtrack includes at least two pieces of music from the films of John Carpenter, who Curtis credited as inspiration for his soundtrack arrangement techniques, as well as tracks from Brian Eno's and Other Green World. There was also music by composers Charles Ives and Ennio Morricone, while Curtis has credited the industrial band Skinny Puppy for the best music in the films. Now here's the political reaction, we're going to be reading this out. Progressive observers are particularly pleased with the film. Common Dreams had a highly positive response to the film, comparing it to the Red Pill of the Matrix series, a comparison Curtis appreciated. Commentary in the Village Voice was also mostly favourable, noting, as is partisan filmmaking, it is often brilliant and sometimes hilarious, a superior version of Syriana. The Nation, while offering a detailed critique on the film's content, said of the film itself, it is arguably the most important film about the war on terrorism since the events of September 11. Among conservative and neoconservative critics in the United States, The Power of Nightmares has been described as conspiracy theory, anti-American, or both. David Asman of FoxNews.com said, We wish we didn't have to keep presenting examples of how the European media have become obsessively anti-American, but they keep pushing the barrier, now to the point of absurdity. His views were shared by commentator Clive Davis, ending his commentary on the film for National Review by saying, British producers hooked on Chomskyite visions of America as the fount of all evil are clearly not interested in even beginning to dig for the truth. Other commentators have variously described the film as pushing a conspiracy theory. Davis and British commentator David Aranovich both explicitly labelled the film's message as a conspiracy theory, with the latter saying of Curtis, his argument is as subtle as a house brick. Attacks in this vein continued after the 7th of July 2005 London bombings, with the Christian Broadcasting Network referencing the film as a source for claims by the British left that the US war on terror was a fraud, and the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council calling it the loopiest, most extreme anti-war documentary series ever sponsored by the BBC. In The Shadows in the Cave, Curtis emphasises that he does not discount the possibility of any terrorist activity taking place, but that the threat of terrorism had been greatly exaggerated. He responded to accusations of creating a conspiracy theory by saying he believes the alleged use of fear as a force in politics is not the result of a conspiracy, but rather the subjects of the film have stumbled on it. Peter Bergen, writing for The Nation, offered a detailed critique of the film. 
Birkin wrote that even if al-Qaeda is not as organized as the Bush administration stressed, it is still a very dangerous force due to the fanaticism of its followers and the resources available to bin Laden. On Curtis's claim that al-Qaeda was the creation of neoconservative politicians, Bergen said, This is nonsense. There is substantial evidence that al-Qaeda was founded in 1988 by bin Laden and a small group of like-minded militants, though the group would mushroom into the secretive of disciplined organization that implemented the 9-11 attacks. Bergen further claimed that Curtis's arguments serve as a defense of Bush's failure to capture bin Laden in the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan and his ignoring warnings of a terrorist attack prior to 11th September. Additional issues have been raised over Curtis's depiction of the neoconservatives. Davis's article in National Review showed his displeasure of Curtis's depiction of Leo Strauss, claiming in Curtis's world it is Strauss, not Osama bin Laden, who is the real evil genius. Peter Bergen claimed the film exaggerated the influence of Strauss over neoconservatism, crediting the political philosophy more to Albert Wallstetter. A 2005 reviewer on Christopher Knowles' filmcritic.com took issue of Curtis's retelling of the attacks on Bill Clinton in The Phantom Victory, crediting these more to the American religious right than the bookish university types of the neoconservative movement. Daniel Pipes, a conservative American political commentator and son of Richard Pipes who was interviewed in the film, wrote that the film dismisses the threat posed by communism to the United States as, in Pipes' words, only a scattering of countries that had harmless communist parties who could in no way threaten America. Pipes noted that the film adopts this conclusion without mentioning the Comintern, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Klaus Fuchs, or Igor Gauzenko. Allegations have been made of omissions in the history described by the film. The absence of discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was noticed by some viewers. Davis claimed that Leo Strauss's ideas had been formed by his experiences in Germany during the Weimar Republic, and alleged that the film's failure to mention this was motivated by a wish to portray Strauss as concerned with American suburban culture, like Kutub. Now, just so I'll read this one passage here, Comparisons to Fahrenheit 9-11. After its release, The Power of Nightmares received multiple comparisons to Fahrenheit 9-11, American filmmaker Michael Moore's 2004 critique of the first four years of George W. Bush's presidency of the United States. The Village Voice directly named The Power of Nightmares as the most widely discussed docu-agate prop since Fahrenheit 9-11. The Nation and Variety both gave comments lauding Curtis's film as superior to Fahrenheit and other political documentaries in various fields. The former cited Curtis's work as being more intellectually engaging and historically probing, while the latter cited balance, broad-mindedness, and a sense of historical perspective. Moore's work has also been used as a point of comparison by conservative critics of Curtis. Curtis has attempted to distinguish his work from Moore's film, describing Moore as a political agate prop filmmaker, arguing that you'd be hard-pushed to tell my politics from watching The Power of Nightmares.